Okay. So, we're here at the example that we arrived at last time. We were at, we, remember we had talked about all of this stuff, right? Estimation. Sample statistics, meaning sample mean, sample variance. We talked about their definitions, the usual definitions, standard deviation. Uh, and then we talked about these really fun things like standard deviations of means, means of means, means of standard deviations, standard deviations of standard deviations. Standard deviation of means. I think that was the first one I said. Uh, and so, sorry, yeah. Uh, and then we, uh, then we talked about um, uh, non-stationary versus stationary signals and how non-stationary signals that have a mean that moves around are a little more difficult to deal with. And then we uh, arrived at this example, and now we're ready. We're ready to dig into this, which, this example, which is pretty, uh, pretty involved, but also really practical as well. So I thought it was worth getting into. OK, so consider the measurement of the temperature inside a desktop computer chassis, like one of the ones in that desk you've got. I think that there's one in those desks. Yeah? The tower, yeah. yeah. Uh, via an inexpensive thermistor, which is a resistor that changes resistance with temperature. The processor and power supply heat the chassis in a manner that depends on processing demand, right? We're all kind of familiar with that. When we want it to do something really intensive processor-wise, the fan kicks on to try to cool it down in there, right? It gets hot. Okay. Uh, for the test protocol, the processors are cycled sinusoidally through processing power levels at a frequency of 50 millihertz. So, like... Pretty slow, right? Um, uh, for 12 periods, NT is the number of periods we're going to cycle through, and sampled at 1 hertz, okay? So 50 millihertz is much slower than 1 hertz, so we're taking samples several times per period, right? Okay. Uh, assume a temperature fluctuation between about 20 and 50 C and Gaussian noise with standard deviation 4 C. Okay. Consider a sample to be the multiple measurements of a certain instant in the period. So we're going to come back around to that same spot in the period 12 times, right? NT equals 12 times. So if we, I'll pull up a one of these. So so we've got a temperature that does this 12 times, right? Where this is like 20 and this is like 50 C. But there's there's randomness to it. There's, there's noise on top of it. So it's actually kind of jittering up and down, right? So happens 12 times, but we're going to consider a sample to be. So we're, we're, we're going to use, there were two methods that were used for non-stationary processes. This is a non-stationary process, right? Because the mean's moving sinusoidally. But we happen to know that it's periodic and that it comes around um, every certain number of seconds. So we are able to chop it at a period, chop it at another period, 12 of these periods, and we can say, oh, this point right here is kind of like this point right here, right? These are just separate measurements of the same quantity. So a sample then is going to be a collection of measurements. This would this would be one of the measurements, say we're, we're taking that, that peak value. This would be another measurement, this would be another measurement, et cetera, right? 12 of them. Whereas like this one right here, this one would be a measurement in the sample, 
This one would be another one of the measurements. This one would be, and we could start doing things like taking the mean of them, taking the standard deviation of them, et cetera. So it's one of the more difficult situations where we have this, this uh, non-stationary process to deal with, but um, if we're careful, we'll be just fine. So uh, the first thing I want us to do is to generate and plot simulated temperature data as a time series and as a histogram or frequency distribution. Comment on why the frequency distribution sucks. Okay, so that's our first task. We'll come back to the other tasks as we go, okay? So our first task is to actually, like, spoof the data, right? We're going to fake it. So <laughs> we do that. Um, I could have just given you guys, and I probably will for an exam, give you guys, like, a data set, right? that I already pre-made. But I'm going to show you guys how to make a data set, which is really useful to do. Right? It's a useful thing to be able to do. So make up a data set. First thing in MATLAB, I always start off with a nice clear and a close all statement. Um, this next thing, didn't worry about that. That was just for saving my figures. So nothing important to see there. So this first task is to generate the temperature data. The temperature data can be generated by constructing an array that is passed to a sinusoid, then randomized by Gaussian random numbers. Note that we need to add, so in one of these, one of these lines down here, well actually two of these lines down here, we have to add one, and that's to avoid the sneaky fence post error. Okay, and, I, and I'll, I'll remind us of what the fence post area is. You may not have heard it called that. But say you had three data points. One, two, three. The interval, there are actually only two intervals, right, in between them. So oftentimes we, we have a little mental... Uh, uh, mistake that happens uh, where we mistake the intervals between values for the actual endpoints because there's always one extra endpoint right so sometimes you got to add that extra endpoint in and it gives it even it still gives me problems to this day I will admit it to this day I still will occasionally screw this up so hopefully I did not on this this one I'm pretty sure I didn't I did the first time I wrote it, and then I had to go back and fix it. So let's, let's define first some parameters. So from the, from the problem that was given, I said that the frequency of the sinusoid was 50 millihertz. So I use this scientific notation here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I can I can send you guys the, the notebook, but you guys have to have kind of like a special environment to run it, which I'd, I feel like it would be hard for you guys to set up. So I can't just like run that URL and it'll put me on that. Unfortunately, no, but I, what I could do is I could send you guys the code snippets. Oh, 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 actually, no, you don't even need that. It's already online. Go to my website. Go to courses. Go to ME315, notes. Well, you know where the notes are, right? Um, and then if you go down to uh, estimation of sample mean and variance, it's already there. So you can, you know, copy and paste that if you want. Which is fine with me. I realize that sometimes it's hard to keep up with all the annotation and all that, so. All right. Aha. Okay. So... Uh, we're decide just defining the parameters that were given in the, in the uh, uh, problem statement, right? The amplitude of oscillation, if I, I said it goes between 20 and 50 C, so the amplitude of that is 
50 minus 20 divided by 2, which is 15. I actually did that math in my head. I didn't even have to use the computer for that one. That was pretty good. Uh, and then the DC offset uh, of oscillation is 35, because if it's going between 20 and 50, it's 35 plus or minus 15, right? Down to 20, up to 50, boom, boom. Sampling frequency, we said it was 1 hertz. The number of sinusoid periods I said was 12. We're going to actually tweak this number a little bit as we do this problem because there's, there are a lot of different uh, uh, interesting things that happen when we tweak that. Standard deviation uh, of the underlying process is 4. So that was the one that we're going to use to generate the data. Yeah? Your NP equals F plus 1. Is that F plus 1 supposed to be 20? So this gives me the number of samples per period. So FS over F. If FS is the, is the, uh, the sampling frequency. If you increase the sampling frequency, we get more points per period. If we increase the frequency of the underlying sinusoid, you get fewer points per period. So essentially, it's a trade-off between more points per period and less points per period. So it should be yeah. F, S over F, like parentheses, then plus one, or is it F over If you felt that you needed to put parentheses, they would go like that. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, MATLAB just assumes that you do not, uh, it, it, it has the same <laughs> multiplication, division, before addition. Yeah, but yeah, so you have to be careful when you do the syntax, but this is, this is the syntax that says um, these, two multi these two divide first and then you add one. And then uh, the, the, number, the total number of samples is going to be, so we just co computed the number of samples per period. And we have the total number of periods. And you have to add one, it turns out, not to get the, the fence post error again. Another one of those gotchas. Uh, and you get the total number of samples. So we're going to compute this cell, and then we're going to have it spit this out. So um, I, will, uh, I won't evaluate this yet, because we haven't talked about the second part yet. OK, so this was first, you know, we're just kind of defining parameters of the of the uh, uh, problem so far. We're going to generate a time array that has the uh, time values spaced from 0 to essentially the, the last point, so the number of periods, nt, divided by f essentially gives us the, the last time value we want. And then we want n points. Okay, so we're just generating our time array where all the samples would take place in this big sinusoid. We're going to plot it in a second, and it will, I think, make a little bit more sense once we plot it. Um, the sinusoidal array is we take the DC component, we add A, which is the amplitude, times sine 2 pi f times TA, which is going to take the sign of each element of the array TA, right? So we're going to have a new array that's going to be like the sign of, of, uh, of TA, but it, it's also going to have the DC offset included in it. It's going to shift everything up, okay? So this is an array that's uh, sinusoid. And then this line is to seed the random number generator. The random number generator, uh, if you don't want it to be the same every time, just don't seed it with anything. Um, but it's nice when you run code to have a seeded num random number generator so that you don't get a new thing every time you run your code. So if you have the same random number generator seed, it always comes up with the same random numbers or pseudo random numbers, right? Um, <laughs> right. Uh, and so 43 is just like, it, it could have been any number I could stick in there uh, to be the, the seed. Um, but it just needs some seed value. You can change the seed if you want. I chose 43. You could choose 14 if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Uh, just seeding it with something makes it so that it reproduces the same output every time you run the code, which is nice. Uh, 
Gaussian noise. Generating Gaussian noise in MATLAB is very easy. You can use the RAND n function. And RAND n is going to give you normal, normally distributed, so Gaussian probability distribution, distributed random numbers with zero mean, so they're about zero, um, with the standard deviation that's determined by the number that you multiply by it. So it has, it has standard deviation one when it comes out of rand n. So if you multiply it by five, it has standard deviation five. If you have multiply it by 0.03, it has standard deviation 0 0.03. So it's nice. You just kind of scale it when it comes out, and then you're good to go. And uh, it's nice to, so rand n, you tell, you tell, if you give it a vector size in there, then it gives you a vector of Gaussian random numbers. Um, in the dimensions that you give it. So size of TA gives us exactly the same size of, of random numbers as the time array. So just like little, little uh, things like this are helpful when you go through. The signal then is going to be the sign with the offset plus the noise. So we're going to add on top of it this noise. And this is going to simulate having a, a process with random noise in it, right? Okay. So, we have an array of data we're ready to plot. So this is like, maybe you took the temperature data actually from the thermistor. Maybe you, you used a, a National Instruments board like the MyRio, or maybe you used an Arduino, or maybe you used some other data acquisition uh, hardware to get the data. Um, but you got the data, or maybe even took it by hand. Who knows? Uh, but you get the data, and you want to plot it. Okay. So that's what we do next. I open up a new figure. Um, you don't have to say h equals. Um, I just use that syntax h equals in order to save the file. So you don't have to use it. But figure would work just fine. And then plot. So I plot, the, the first argument of plot is the time array. And the second argument is the signal array. They should be the same dimensions because I generated them in a way that was going to give me the same exact dimensions. Then I say, give me uh, uh, points and then lines in between the points and make the uh, color of the lines in between the points a gray color, RGB, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, gives you a gray. And then uh, marker face color, blue. Marker edge color, none. I didn't want to have an edge on the, on the dots. And marker size, three. Labeled the x-axis, labeled the y-axis, and then this last line is just to save. So I don't think I evaluated this one, so I'll evaluate it. And then I'll evaluate this one. And we get this. Got to zoom out just a little bit so you can see it. OK. So what we have is 12 periods of the sinusoid. And it's pretty noisy, right? Like four, four uh, as your standard deviation for Gaussian on top of a, a signal with an amplitude of of uh, 15 is like a pretty good amount of noise. So I mean, if you look at the signal, you'd be like, I know there's a sign in there. <laughs> like it definitely looks like there's a sign in there, but it's pretty noisy. So you probably need to take quite a few cycles. We took just 12 in this just to get us started. Um, so if you guys are like trying to keep up and you're having a hard time getting all of this, you don't really need all of this other stuff here. Just plot, TA, and then signal, and then you're good. This stuff is just for formatting to make it look nice. So it's good to do, but you know when you're in a hurry. So notice that it goes about between negative 15 and negative 50, but it has all the noise in it. So cool. So we've got we've got ourselves some nice random data. We've learned how to plot that random data. So that's a good start. 
And then our next, uh, oh, we also wanted to do the frequency distribution, right? This next bit of code doesn't show up in the, the PDF because it's just me saving the figures. So like this figure and stuff, I, when, I, when I run the notebook to save it, it saves this figure, but it, you don't need to worry about that, this bit of code, that's all it does. Okay, now let's build a, a histogram or a, um, uh, the frequency distribution. So there's a nice function in MATLAB. So we open a new figure again. Nice function in MATLAB called histogram. They used to, we used to use hist. That's like old school now. You don't use hist anymore. You use histogram. I don't know why. It's deprecated for some reason. So histogram, you give it the signal. And what it does is it essentially builds a probability mass function for you from those data points. So it puts them in bins and just like plots the bins. So you don't have to do any of that work, which is also really nice because it's kind of a pain. If you've never written your own uh, uh, histogram generator, it's kind of annoying. This, the first argument is signal A. So you just stick the signal in there. The second argument is the number of bins. Okay, 30 I chose. Because I think that looks about right. And then if you give it this optional argument normalization probability, it gives you the actual probability mass function scaling. Otherwise, the default is to give you frequency. So it would give you the, the, uh, uh, the, the number of values that landed in each bin and not the probability. So it's just a scaling thing, but it's kind of nice to use that, that scaling. And if you evaluate that, you get yourself a nice probability mass function. But it isn't nice, right? Why isn't it nice? Yeah, because, I mean, you look at this, it's going, so it's, it's centered around 35, goes to about 15, down to 15, and up to about... 50 something but what you're doing is you're essentially like taking all of these data points and you're like standing on this end of the graph over here or maybe let's we'll say this end of the graph over here we're standing there and then we're just like let them all fall towards me and catch them in bins right but it's fine but what's happening is your mean value is changing right and when we typically look at a frequency distribution or a probability mass function, what we're interested in is the randomness, the probability distribution of the random signal. But we've got this sinusoid in there that's screwing it all up, right? So it just kind of looks like crap because it's not really, it, you actually see more stuff happening out here than you do in the center because it's spending more time out there. Yeah, if you have a different number of bins, or actually, and you also have a different data set because your random number is different. So. Ours is the same. Mine doesn't look like the same as yours. The code you have on the notes here gives you a frequency, not a probability. It doesn't have the normalization. Yeah. So if you scroll down in the same notes, though, there's a spot where you can put in normalization towards the end. In this one, it's not, huh? Maybe I didn't update them. I must not have updated them. Um, hmm. I'll make sure that that gets updated online. I, I, in an earlier version, I didn't have it doing the probability, so. Make sure you have the latest notes. Yeah, so if you change the bin size, so the bin size also matters, right? Because if you have more bins, then you're going to have skinnier and skinnier spikes. and It looks a little different. Okay. All right. So uh, that was the last thing from, from part one. 
Part two, compute the sample mean and standard deviation for each sample in the cycle. And remember, it's weird, but we're calling the, the group of points that are connected here a sample, right? A sample is a collection of measurements of the same thing, hopefully. <laughs> So whenever we get to this point up here, this is when we're like, okay, at the peaks, we're, we're at like the same, we're measuring the same thing, hopefully. Uh, and when we're in the valleys, we're hopefully at the same thing. So these constitute a sample, not, not the, the points across a period, but the points um, um, that connect from one period to the next. So each period, you get another point in your sample, okay? So, uh, compute the sample mean and standard deviation for each sample in the cycle. So, we're down here. Um, so, we must pick out the NT data points that correspond to each other. Currently, they're all in one long 1 by N array, signal A, right? It is helpful to reshape the data so it is an NT by NP array, which each row corresponding with each row corresponding to a new period. Okay? This leaves the correct points aligned in columns. It is important to note that we can do this by the folding operation only when we know rather precisely the period of the underlying sinusoid. It is given in the problem um, that it is a controlled experiment variable. If we did not know it, we would have to estimate it, too, from the data. But we're saying that, OK, we're, we're uh, setting this experiment up, and we're cycling the processors, so we know what the frequency is pretty, pretty precisely. So we don't need to worry about measuring it separately. And to give you an idea of what we're trying to do now like with this array is currently all these points you know, ch -ch 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 -ch, all the way along. They're just in one long array. So it's like we have something that's like 37, 42, 48, et cetera, some long array, right? With, with uh, NP or N, I should say, N values. Okay, but what we want is to say, okay, once we get to the end of a period, so we get to, to here, we want to take that next period worth of data and, and move that chunk to the next row of our data. So when we come in here, as we say, okay, when we get to the end of the first period, we're going to cut it, and we're going to take the next chunk, and we're going to put it in the, ne in the next row of the of the data. So we're going to we're going to turn this thing into a matrix instead of one long vector, okay? And, and uh yeah, so uh, after the first period, then you break it and go to the next line. So it's like we're word wrapping, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So like we were going on and on with the line and then it's like, oh, but we're, we're out of space in this line, go to the next line. But the word wrap happens at the end of each period. Boom, you got to go to the next line. So we're going to end up with the number of rows is going to be NT, which is the number of periods, right? So we have 12 when we first start. So 12 rows. And then we're going to have NP columns, which is the number of points per period. So an NT by NP array. And in MATLAB, every time I use this function, I have to like thrash around with it, and I hate it. The reshape function, for whatever reason, it's really weird, but you can make it do what you want um, if you uh, uh, play with it long enough. So in any case, it's an annoying function, but what you can do is you can take this and essentially reshape it in just the way that we discussed and when you get this out it's going to have 12 by 21 which NT is the 12 21 is your NP and I printed out the first three rows and the first four columns just to see the data so okay this is what the data looks like 
just so we have a, an idea of what it'll look like. But then, of course, it goes off, and there are 21 columns, and there are 12 rows, but I didn't want to print off all of that. So that's why this uh, call right here is to just print the, the first three rows and four columns. Okay? So if I evaluate that, I get the same thing. Out. Okay. So then to find the mean variance and standard deviation functions as anonymous functions. We roll our own in this one. Um, they're not as efficient or as flexible as the built-in MATLAB functions mean, var, and std, which should typically be used. <laughs> That's the name of the function. I, I'm just here to tell you about it. There are there are some awkwardly named things out there. So did you like what I decided to name my function my STD? Yes, I like to personalize these things. So, uh, but what, what the idea of these my mean, my variance, my standard deviation is that we could just use the built-in functions, but it's nice to get some practice writing some functions of our own. So what I did was I said, OK, it, the input argument is a vector. You're going to sum up all the values of the vector. Sum is a built-in MATLAB function. And then divide it by the length of the vector, which is the number of elements in that vector. And it should return what is the mean, right? My var just uses the variance, the, the, the sample variance equation. And it takes the sum of the difference between each value in the vector and the mean value of the vector. It squares each value, sums them up, divides by length of the vector minus 1. Okay, That was the formula that we had. And, and then the, the standard deviation is nice. Uh, we can just call the my variance um, and take the square root of it. So we don't have to rewrite the stuff and then take the square root. We could just call the other function. OK. Now, I am realizing that this is just going to be one of those late classes. Hopefully, nobody's got to go right away. Uh, how late are we staying? Um, let's just get, let's get to the end of this, this part, and then we'll revisit how much time is left. Okay. So now the sample mean, variance, and standard deviations can be computed. We proceed by looping through each column of the reshaped signal array. So the reshaped signal array, remember, we have NT rows and NP columns. And a sample corresponds to a column here, right? So all of these values in a column correspond to all of these values, right? Or this value, this value, this value. So these are all appearing in a column now. Well, it, if, they, if there was no randomness, then yes. But since we have that random noise in there that made it all crazy looking like this, um, those peak values are varying, right? So we, what we're going to do is we're going to take the mean of them. And so that, then we'll get a, a, our best estimate of what that should be. For each period, is there the same number of individual points along the line? Yeah, there are, there are 21 of them, NP of them. So we just go through uh, each one of those points, and we take the mean of the column. Okay, so signal AR was the reshaped signal. And this syntax says take all of the rows in the ith column. So we're going through each column. So i is changing from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the first column, it's going to take my mean of the first column. And then the second column is going to take my var of the second column, etc. Et it's going to go around and around and do this. 
And when we're going to populate these uh, uh, arrays that I initialized, which are just just uh, vectors, right? One by NP vectors. So this is sort of like the, like, you know, in a, in a spreadsheet, we have like the sum row at the bottom. That's like what our, so our we have like a mean, a standard deviation, or a mean row at the bottom, as a mean, or a variance row at the bottom, and a standard deviation row at the bottom, right? Um, and we're going to get, a value for each of those. Oops, didn't define these. So now, for instance, I could evaluate what is mu a. And it'll spit out 21 values of the means. OK? All right. So. Let's go back up here. So we just finished two. Whoa. So you guys, this stuff just takes a while. It's, it's almost as if, yeah. So I think what I'll do here, since I'm recording this, um, I think I'm just going to go on for a little bit more at least. And if you can't stay, then you can just watch the video. I'll make sure to upload it today or tomorrow so that you can watch the video and go through. You can sit down with MATLAB and go through on your own and follow it too. The, um, I was able to track with you up until the first or second lecture, the second part of the history. Oh. The code I'm using is not the other uh, okay, yeah. So, um, so I'll make sure that, that the code is updated too. Yeah, so I was able to get it. I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Yeah, it's a lot more. And the code that I'm using doesn't come up as the same. So if you got both, I'm saying you have to go. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no worries. You can slowly unpack it, but not too much. Yeah, no worries. All right, so let's talk about the composite frequency distribution. So the columns represent samples, right? We just talked about how the columns represent the samples. We want to subtract the mean from each column, OK? And that was because this, in this third part, what I asked of us was to subtract the mean from each sample in the period such that each sample distribution is centered at 0, OK? Then plot the composite frequency distribution of all samples together. This represents our best estimate of the frequency distribution of the underlying process. Because what we're trying to do is essentially subtract out this sinusoid. Okay, we're taking, we, we just took the average value um, of each sample, right? And we're trying to subtract out that average value, which is essentially our best estimate of that sinusoid. You got something cool. I got one. You got one? So, so if you, so you guys, you guys are trying to get this. Are you guys stuck on something? Oh no, I got it. Hey, nice. Mine, mine was just uh, oh. forked up. It was a, uh, it was a fork and shirt ball. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, in order to uh, subtract the mean from each column. We are going to use this nice rep mats function that MATLAB has. What it does is it just repeats the same array over and over again in the uh, dimensions that you give it. So I want to repeat the mean for NT rows over and over again. So that allows us to subtract out directly the mean. And we can check to make sure that we didn't screw up the size. It's still 12 by 21, which is good. And uh, let's print out the first three rows and four columns. We see now that our signal is centered around zero, or approximately. It's moving around zero instead of up in the 50s to 30s. So it looks about right to us. Now that all samples have the same mean, we can lump them into one big bin for the frequency distribution. 
There are some nice built-in functions to do a quick reshape and fit. So I, I use the reshape again, but this time, instead of reshaping it into a matrix, I go back to uh, a vector with it. Um, and so this is the, the uh, signal array that was reshaped. And then we took the zero mean, and then we're doing a resize again. So that's what we have here. We'll check the size of it, 1 by 252, which is the right, the right size. And then we can use this nice uh, p, uh, uh, fit dist function in, that MATLAB comes with. Um, you can uh, find the normal fit. And I didn't actually ask for this in the problem, but it was so easy to do in MATLAB, I thought I might as well just do this. So the fit distribution, it takes your signal in and it, and it gives you a fit for the, the, uh, the distribution. So I found the PDF fit model. Um, and then I generated an array of 100 values between negative 15 and positive 15, which encompassed all of the vertical uh, values that I wanted to see. Um, and I, you can evaluate a probability density function, which this fit dist returns a probability density function to you. So you can evaluate that model at the points that you specified in XA. That's all this is. This is all just to get a, a, a this, all this fit stuff is just to get a nice probability density function that is fit uh, to the data that we have. Not even actually required, but it's, an, it's a good thing to be able to do. So I, I did show you how to do that. Um, and uh, uh, the norm PDF then is a function that allows you to give it that, those same data points. Um, and then this is a, uh, a normal distribution PDF. It allows you to do a theoretical um, uh, probability density function with the f uh, standard deviation of four and zero mean. And so that, that gives us a fit PDF to the data, and it gives us a, a theoretical PDF. And then we also have the, 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 the probability mass function the PMF, which is the bin version of the data. So we have all three of those we can plot together. And if we do that, get this pretty thing. And that one looks a lot better. So this looks like a real probability mass function of a Gaussian. That is, it seems like more reasonable. Um, the the uh, estimated probability density function or the fit probability density function is in dark blue. And notice how close it is to the, the theoretical probability density function that we use. Remember, we use this, this theoretical one to generate the data. So, I mean, it, it makes sense. But we did add it to this sinusoid. So we did effective, uh, we did a good job of taking enough data to get a decent estimate of the underlying random process. We also did a good job of, of uh, correctly um, uh, fitting the, the probability distribution. So now we're ready for the next step, which is the, the comparison of the means. So, so we want to plot a comparison of the theoretical mean, which is 35, right? So it goes between 20 and 50, so the DCL says 35. So the, the theoretical mean of this whole thing is 35. Um, and so we want to plot a comparison between the theoretical mean, which is 35, and the sample mean, uh, sample mean of means with an error bar. So vary the number of samples NT and comment on its effect on the estimate. So we think typically more samples, better estimate, right? So that's what we're hoping to see. So let's do it with just our NT of 12 to start. And good. So the sample mean of means is simply, you can just call my mean of the means that we already computed, right? Computed the means of the columns. We could just take the means of the, of the means then and get 
and get this value. Um, we, we could have gone back and like put all of the data points in one big bin and taken the means, but since we already had, it's equivalent to taking the mean of the means we've already computed mathematically. So 35.1, that's pretty close to 35, so we did okay, right? That was pretty good. Uh, the standard deviation that works um, as an error bar, which should reflect how well we can estimate the point plotted, is the standard deviation of the means. So it's important to, so when you, when you are thinking about putting an error bar on a plot, on a data point on a plot, there are different sort of schools of thought, but I've always been in the school of thought that says this, the error bar should reflect how well you know that point that you plotted. Um, the error bar should be a standard deviation of whatever you plot it. So if you're plotting the means, you need to have an error bar that is the standard deviation of the means. If you were just plotting a value, you could plot th a, the value with an error bar that was just a standard deviation. But since you're plotting a mean, you should be plotting the standard deviation of a mean. That's one, that's one good way to check yourself uh, as far as determining which standard deviation you should use for your error bar. Um, so standard deviation, yeah, okay. Uh, so it is difficult to compute the, the standard deviation of the means directly for a non-stationary process, right? Because the means, as you remember, as you recall, they're like, it, the means essentially come out to be an approximation of the sine wave. So the standard deviation of those is going to be like that original uh, probability mass function that looks weird because the mean's moving around, right? So the standard deviation of the means, you can't compute it directly, at least in a naive way. So we use the estimate given above, so in the theoretical part from last lecture, we, we uh, uh, used, there was a formula that was given to estimate the standard deviation of the means. Um, we improve on it, though, by, by saying, okay, you can approximate the standard deviation of the means by taking the standard deviation from one of the bins, one of the samples, and dividing it by the square root of nt. Well, you can approximate the, the standard deviation of the means better, in this case, if you assume that you have a process that's not changing, um, then you can, you can get a better estimate by taking the mean of those standard deviations to get a better estimate of standard deviation, and then dividing it by the square root of, of nt. So we get 1.58 in this case. And now it's just a, a simple plot, right? It, we're estimating one value, which is the mean of the means. And that should be around 35. We already computed it. The mean of the means was around 35. So it's just a bar plot. And then we can plot it with a, an error bar which is just the standard deviation of the means. The error bar function, so you can use bar as the, as the original plot, and then you can use error bar to give you the error bar on top of it. Uh, make sure that you use this hold on command uh, after your bar plot function, otherwise you end up um, rewriting the plot. And um, this stuff is just LaTeX prettiness as far as the labels go and saving. Um, but the idea is, OK, we know that the mean of the means for this process is about 35 with an error bar that is about, well, the error bar is plus or minus 1.16, right? The, the standard deviation of the means estimate that we have. So that is our. Um, our understanding of the uh, our best estimate for the mean of the means. Now, let's go back up because this, this, the next section is actually similar. So we're going to vary our uh, nt, and actually we'll do the next three sections. Um, we'll finish it off, and then we'll vary nt for all of them so that you can see. Um, the next one is to uh, plot a comparison of the theoretical standard deviation, which is 4, right? We generated that data with standard deviation of 4. So we want to compare this theoretical standard deviation and the sample uh, uh, mean of sample standard deviations with an error bar. 
So we're also estimating the standard deviation. So vary the, uh, and then eventually we'll vary the number of, of samples, nt. So that section is here. So the standard deviations comparison. Uh, that was me goofing around, so no need to worry about that. Um, <laughs> Okay, the sample mean of standard, de uh, of standard deviations is simply the following. You take literally the mean of the standard deviations array that you computed at the first part. So it's just your best estimate of what the standard deviation is. And we get 4.01, which is pretty close to the theoretical value that we used, which was 4. So a pretty good estimate. Um, a standard deviation that works as an error bar, which remember should reflect how well we can estimate the point plotted. So we want to know how well can we estimate the mean of the standard deviations. And that's going to be the standard deviation of the standard deviations, actually. Um, the mean of the standard deviation tells you how, you know, what the best value of the standard deviation is. The standard deviation of the standard deviations tells you how much the standard deviation varied between the different estimates of the standard deviation. So we just take my standard deviation of the standard deviations and get 0.85. A simple plot, just using bar and error bar again, shows us that we're right at the theoretical value of 4. Our standard deviation is about 0.85, right? 0.85, plus or minus. Okay. So that gives us our, our standard deviation estimate. Now we're almost there. Last section is to plot the sample mean over a single period with error bars of plus or minus one sample standard deviation of the means. This represents our best estimate of the sinusoidal heating temperature. So probably if you're doing this test, this is the thing you're most interested in. This is the, like, the, 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 the money graph that you want, okay? So uh, then, we'll, then we'll vary NT and we'll comment on how it changes all of these estimates that we've made. So here we are. Now, plotting the data with error bars is fairly straightforward with the built-in error bar function. The main question is which standard deviation do we put on there as the error bar? Since we're plotting the means, it makes sense to plot the error bars as a single sample standard deviation of the means. We want to do the standard deviation of whatever we're plotting. So the standard deviation of the means if we're plotting the means. So we do just that. We do error bar. We plot our means. And then, so the error bar function takes in the time values. We just take one period of time values, so from 0 to 18 point whatever seconds, that's the, the period. And uh, then we plot our means, which are the center of these error bars in blue. And then we plot the uh, error bars as being one standard deviation uh, uh, away. So one standard deviation of the means. So that's what we have. And then the red line is just generated by using the, um, the theoretical sinusoid. So in, in theory, if you did, took this data long enough, you would be able to shrink these error bars smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where you got down to um, uh, a very, very close approximation of the population mean. Because you're, you're essentially mitigating the effect of the randomness um, there. So uh, that is the last step. And we evaluate it and we see we, we did a pretty good job. I mean, considering how noisy that data was, we took 12 periods of data and we got a pretty good approximation of that sinusoid. I mean, it's very rare that the population mean, the, you know, the, the, the real mean, 
if you will, uh, is outside of the error bar. Usually it's in with, uh, within one standard deviation of the error bar, which is pretty good. Now let's, let's, let's try to change, let's increase nt, the, the number of periods that we take data over, and let's see how it affects our approximation, so our, our estimates of these different values. So way back up here, we can change nt. Let's go up to like 32. And so that we've got 32 periods to plot. Good times, right? And then we plot this. And once again, this first probability distribution looks crappy, right? And then we come down here, we reshape. We get 32 rows now instead of just 12. We compute our means. We subtract out the means. We fit the probability distribution. We plot the probability distribution. Notice we have another, I mean, the original estimate was pretty nice too, but another nice estimate of the probability density function in Seahawks colors, I might add. And not that they deserve it right now. Um, our mean of means is 35.04, which is once again very close to 35, which is the theoretical value. Our standard deviation of the means drops. So we increased, remember, we increased the number of periods by uh, a factor of like, well, no, it wasn't quite three, right? But we improved that by almost a factor of two. So um, we actually, notice we improved by the square, oh, divided by the square root of nt. So you don't get, you have to like take the square of, of your uh, uh, increase in order to get a nice, nice scaling. But um, then we're going to see how much better this plot gets, right? So let's see. Oops. That was this one. So we have it a little bit tighter now. About half. Uh, our mean of the standard deviation, so 4.01 was our estimate of the standard deviation uh, before. Now, 4.03. Actually, was worse. Randomness, you know? This isn't always, doesn't always work out for you. Um, standard deviation went down a little bit. Uh, the plot... So that estimate didn't get really significantly better. The error bars now, we're, we're expecting these to get a little bit better, right? And they, and they did. Yeah, pretty tight. I mean, definitely getting nice. So we, I mean, we, could, we could ramp this up to you know, NT of like 150, and we could get really tight. I don't know if I'll, I'll do it and see how many time we get. You did 75? Yeah, pretty good. Nice. Yeah. 200. Whoa. Very nice. Oh, yeah. 200 is good. 30 seconds, like, oh, seven, eight, eight, eight. Ah, he it killed my kernel. They, they knew <laughs> it was too much. It was too much. They knew it was supposed to be uh, three hours. Yeah. Well. So can you take this thing and use it as a backwards message? So like some kind of standard range of something that's an acceptable level, and then add in random signals like air quality or how much radiation is in an area. 
mm -hmm. and, and set that curve to, to fall within or without of, like, see if it falls within the acceptable range of No, but I'm just asking a question. Yeah, so. I'm generally inquisitive. Yeah, so it, what you can do is you can compute these statistics, right? Like the standard deviation of something. And if, it, if it's, you, know, you might have some expectations about it. So like in these, some experiments that I run, we have some pretty good theoretical predictions of what the noise should look like. So in the data, we constantly monitor the statistics of the noise. Mm -hmm. And if everything's making sense, those statistics will come out a certain way. Like the mean will be a certain thing, standard deviation will be a certain thing. Those higher moments we talked about, skew and kurtosis, they'll be certain things. And if something's going wrong, like if we have some like uh, uh, parasitic noise signal coming in from someplace we didn't think it should, uh, it'll start throwing exceptions and say, you know, something's wrong. Like check to make sure you didn't leave the, you know, the, the RF radiation on or something like that. So it, it, it warns us. So yeah, you can do things like that. Like if you know what the statistics should, should come out to be, you can test to see if a certain data set has those statistics, right? So that would be, you know, we would do this in the loop and we would just update it. Could you make something like that run for, no, instead of, instead of generating one random signal mm -hmm. and inputting it and then it gives you back a best fit, like error, you know, percentage line in Frank, mm -hmm. could you make it run where the signal's changing all the time, and the, the the your picture of your signal, and then the error running alongside of it fluctuates as well. Yeah, yeah, and actually that's a that's a good point because a lot of times our signal so like this signal is periodic, right? Right. But some signals are not periodic. We still want to measure them, and they they're still time varying, right? So you have to come up with other methods to deal with something that's not periodic. And that, you know, there, there are a lot. I mean, the one way you can go is you can just take an average in a small window um, and then just forget about the previous window. Take a new average in the next window. Maybe you think things are changing on the order of, of uh, maybe seconds in, in as terms of like the, the transients are changing in terms of seconds. So you could, you could uh, maybe take samples for 10 milliseconds. You could sample for 10 milliseconds, compute a mean, compute a standard deviation, like save the data, forget about it, take a new window of 10 milliseconds, take the mean, take the standard deviation, forget about everything that happened before that. If your mean's changing relatively quickly, that's what you have to do. You don't really have any other options. Um, if your mean's changing, like if our mean changed, like this, uh, if our mean was changing, like if maybe we were measuring something that was a, uh, like a, an exponential decay to some new equilibrium. Well, but it was noisy. And we wanted to, we, we wanted to smooth this out, this data out. We can't just like, take a mean over this whole time period, um, or, or what we would get is this value, right? And it wouldn't really tell us much. What we want is to see this mean changing, but we want to smooth this out. There are a lot of ways you can go. Uh, one way is to just take a window, you know, every so often, and average in there and make it one data point, and that smooths it. So that's windowing. There's another, uh, another way you can go is to build a filter, right? So this is high frequency stuff that's happening here. Um, the noise often happens at higher frequencies than the signal we care about. So filtering it out would be a good idea. You can either filter it at the analog side, which is where you want to filter it if you can, because aliasing can happen if you don't. So it, but if you can't filter it in analog, so putting in like an RC filter at least, or maybe some better filter, then if you go up to uh, the digital side, you can still do, you can do a filter on the digital signal as well, on, on the data points. 
Um, there are built-in MATLAB functions for doing this. It's great. There's like filt, filt is one. I don't know if you guys ever played with that one, but yeah, it'll like just run it through a filter. Yeah, it's, it, sometimes it's scary because you don't know what you're doing very well. Um, but yeah, so there are filters you can use. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so you, you have to know some stuff about the problem in order to do this properly. Because if your window is too large, then you're not going to get a very good approximation of this transient that's happening, right? Yeah. So you need to know some stuff about your noise, the frequency of the, uh, of the noise signal coming in. Uh, you also need to know something about the, um, uh, about the signal you're trying to measure. So, what you know, and, and usually, with something like this, you would you would want to contrive your test to take multiple measurements, right? Because maybe if this is a nice exponential response and you did and you got this by changing the input, you could do it again, right? You could like let it come back to equilibrium and you could do it again. And actually, that's what you guys are going to be doing in your next lab, uh, in the ME three sixteen lab. Um, you guys are going to be doing this with a thermal system. You're going to be heating it. And you're going to see this sort of thing happen, and then you're going to be cool. And you're going to let it cool down, and you're going to heat it again. And you can take multiple, multiple uh, uh, measurements of this, and then once again, you can take this period and stick it underneath this other one in an array, and start doing averages so that this value is like this value in your columns, and start taking the average. So yeah, so doing some heat transfer, you guys are just getting it all. It's, it's, you guys are you guys are gonna be so so cool when you're done with this.